Dealing with adversity and finding ways to unify and overcome it will always be part of our future. The new season of Hope Through History, a documentary podcast presentation from C-13 Originals in association with the History Channel, written and narrated by me, John Meacham, features moments in our nation's past when we faced challenges as a country and as a world. Listen and follow Season 2 of Hope Through History, available now wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Tracy Clayton. And I'm Josh Gwynn, and we're the hosts of Back Issue. We're back with Season 2. You can remember the name of our show, Back Issue, because we're back for Season 2. And we have issues... Not wrong. (laughs) We're going to revisit moments in pop culture we all think we remember and learn what they can teach us about where we are now. We're going to talk about Whitney Houston, food you used to love, your favorite and forgotten singers of the 9 and the 2000s, and more. So join Tracy and I with Back Issue Season 2. Listen on Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. What's up, everyone? I'm Carmelo Anthony. And while you may know me as a basketball player, there's a whole lot more I'm ready to talk about. That's why I started What's in Your Glass, a show where we'll sit down for a glass of wine and a conversation with the biggest names in sports, music, media, and entertainment. Listen and follow What's in Your Glass, a presentation of Cadence 13 and Creative 7 with me, Carmelo Anthony, now for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey, or wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Southern California, this is the Jim Rome Show with guest host Bill Ryder on CBS Sports Radio. Welcome back into the Jim Rome Show. Bill Ryder with you, coming to you live from the Rocket Mortgage Studios when you need cash out of your home and a simple way to get it, Rocket Can. Phone number 1 800 636 8686. Jim off this week as well. I'm here today and Wednesday. Still hit us up at Jim Rome, Jim Rome. Dot com sports writer sports r e i t e r for me Howard Beck's going to be on the show in about thirty or forty minutes. Awesome national NBA reporter now for Sports Illustrated, previously Bleacher Report, the New York Times. Great guy, insightful. We'll give you some perspective from him on NBA free agency. We'll talk to Alana Rizzo from MLB Network in about an hour and a half. And in just a minute, I'm going to hit Carson Wentz. Although Tom De Benedetto who is now part of the Jim Rome Show, which is awesome and weird for me because we worked together for four years, three years, whatever it was before this. And Garrett Ritt, who I only know through here, or hanging out, we were talking, and we talk about Russell Westbrook. That news broke last Thursday. I'm sure the guys hit it on Friday. Here's my very short version because Tom asked me, you know, why do you think LeBron wanted Westbrook? I've convinced Tom, I've sold Tom, that Westbrook is um, a great guy, by the way. Terrible basketball player today. I actually had this is terrible is a little strong, but I called a source. This is true. I called a source and I go, Yeah, I think he's one of the bigger, you know, he's a really talented guy who can't win. And the guy goes, You know, when a source, you've offended a source. He goes, No, you're wrong. I'm like, Oh, I mean, this is an important source. I'm like, oh, I made this guy mad. He's like, You're wrong, Bill. I'm like, Oh, okay. He sucks at basketball, is what he said. I'm like, He sucks at basketball. He doesn't suck. He sucks at basketball. I'm not going to go that far. I think it's a bad fit. I don't think his game translates to the modern game. I don't think it's going to work. And Tom asked me, why did LeBron do it? And here's my, here's my short answer. Here's my take on, on LeBron James recruiting Russell Westbrook in 10 seconds. LeBron James is as bad a GM as he is great a basketball player. And since I think he's the best or second best basketball player of all time, I also think he's the worst or second worst GM in the history of the NBA. That's it. That's my take. Russ ain't going to work. You got to make good moves. You got to stay healthy. Doesn't matter the sport. The Colts made all the good moves. They did. You can go player for player, and you could make an argument that the Colts have the best roster in the National Football League. They certainly have a top five roster. They are loaded across the board. What they've been missing since Andrew Luck decided, obviously surprisingly, a couple years ago that he was done with the game as a top, what, five quarterback? as a would-have-been, sure thing, locked-in Hall of Famer. And it turns out, I think, I think Super Bowl champion, based on what the Colts are building. What they were missing since Luck stepped away was a QB. And there's some irony in that, because obviously all of these teams in the National Football League require a quarterback. Just talk to Channing Crowder. They hope to as the guy in Miami. The Dolphins need a quarterback. But it's not like the Dolphins have a head coach who's a offensive guru, right? Brian Flores, different background. That's what Frank Reich is. This is a guy 
who was able in Philadelphia as the offensive coordinator to turn Carson Wentz into an MVP candidate, would have been the MVP Wentz that 2016 season, had he not gotten injured for the last four games of the year, five games, four games of the year. And then, Reich, was the guy, the coordinator, who had to transfer everything he wanted done to a guy named Nick Foles. So Frank Reich goes to the Colts, well-respected, missing his quarterback, hasn't been able to make it work. And what does he do? It, it was a coup, I thought. It's one of the, there's 10 or 11 really interesting unanswered questions we're going to get we're going to get some insight on this upcoming NFL season. Can't wait. And one of them was, what is Carson Wentz when he returns to that offensive coordinator from his Philly days, his glory days in Philly, now that that offensive coordinator, Frank Reich, is the man in, with the Colts, right? We're going to find out, really, I think Bill Belichick minus Tom Brady. He's got a quarterback who's back. He's got a quarterback he drafted. They spent a record amount for that franchise in free agency. A bunch of guys that opted out are back. We're going to get an answer on, on the Patriots. We're going to get an answer, I think, on on Matthew Stafford and whether or not he is Kirk Cousins, right? Great until he's not, or whether he's something different. We're going to get an answer on Jared Goff. We're going to get a response from Patrick Mahomes to what it is to have your heart broken in the Super Bowl. I think he's going to have a all, all career year in his short career, which is saying something. There's a lot of things out there that are absolutely fascinating. And one of them was going to be, what is Carson Wentz with Frank Reich? Problem is... The answer is, he's what he's always been. He's Humpty Dumpty. He fell off the wall. He's broken. Nobody's putting it back together. And I don't take pleasure in that. I get no joy from from guys being injured. You know, M. Night Shyamalan is one of the most controversial directors of all time in the sense nobody makes movies this bad and this good. And I've had all these weird debates around green rooms the last, because I've been traveling four weeks, about is M. Night Shyamalan a good director? Apparently, because this new new show out called Old, uh, apparently... That's a great movie. And so they've had all of these rankings and on BuzzFeed News and all these other random places, Hollywood Reporter, all the M. Night Shyamalan movies in a row. And every single one has Unbreakable really high, and every single one shows Samuel Jackson as, as Mr. Glass. I would just recommend they replace that with Carson Wentz because that's what he is. He's a real-life Mr. Glass. He can't stay healthy. The foot injury – that had sidelined him in this training camp, is now the foot injury that is going to sideline him, according to Schefter, for 5 to 12 weeks because he's going to have surgery on it. And when Carson Wentz is going to miss 5 to 12 weeks, in my non-scientific, no medical background history at all, I'm just going to tell you, that's 8 to 15. That's, That's what it is. This is a guy who has had an ACL and LCL injury, 2017, He fractured his back in 2018. Concussion last year, if memory serves. The guy can't stay healthy. And what's what's brutal for Carson Wentz and brutal for, for the Colts is that he is not someone like, say, Anthony Davis as a comparison in in the NBA, who was guaranteed to be great in Indianapolis. This is a two-pronged question for the Colts. Can he stay healthy? And if he's healthy, can he, be, can he be good again? And the answer is already no. Last year, Carson Wentz, the hope of Indianapolis, was 3-8-1. and one. He had 15 touchdown passes to 16 interceptions, and he completed a paltry 57% of his passes. He was a bad playing quarterback in the National Football League. Bad at it. And now, the Colts, who put every one of their eggs in this basket, who thought, and I get where Frank Reich is coming from, that they could unlock the key to Wentz. They could return him to what he used to do. He is clearly a talented guy. They just forgot the golden rule of Carson Wentz, and that is you cannot rely on him to be healthy. I used to say this is a joke, and now I mean it as a fact. If you have a great roster, and you think you have Super Bowl aspirations, and you have a real chance to do something special, you have to have Nick Foles as your backup quarterback. I mean, and I'm not, I'm not even kidding. Foles should have done it twice, by the way. Was it Alshon Jeffrey where the ball just went through his hands in that game against the Saints? I believe. I'm getting the thumbs up, so I'm, I'm remembering properly. Carson Wentz is broken. And he's not going to get fixed. This isn't a one-off. He's a guy that just can't stay healthy. 
And so one of the great questions, one of the interesting questions of the National Football League this year has been answered. Can Carson Wentz return to his former glory? No. No. Five to 12 weeks from now, and it's not going to be five, right? A guy that is fragile, a guy that has hurt a lot, a guy that just can't physically sustain and take the punishment of the National Football League is a guy you, you can't rush back. I mean, you literally can't, you are unable to count on Carson Wentz to be healthy when he's healthy. I don't know that you're going to be able to count on him to be healthy now that he's not. So let's call it, let's just say it's 10 weeks. You're talking conservatively six games he's going to miss before he can get back to playing with an organization that's going to have massive expectations because of the roster they put together. And one of two things are going to happen. Jacob Eason, I'm not counting on this, is going to have played so well they're going to be contenders and then they're going to question whether they really need Wentz or more likely, really unfair position to put that dude in. They're not going to win a lot of football games. Wentz is going to come back. He's going to have that question mark of his health whenever he returns and it could be 12 weeks from now, three months from this moment. Three months from now. And the pressure and the expectation And the frailty he's shown could all add up to the fact that he breaks mentally, not just physically. And that's not a stretch. This guy has had this bizarre career. Because, and Nick Foles, it's not like Nick Foles went off, got his money, and became a superstar. There was just a weird, there was a weird fit for Foles and Wentz in that that Eagles organization. But Foles was the guy that won them the Super Bowl. And the Eagles chose Carson. And then he played badly and and wasn't healthy again and again and again. This season was going to be and is going to be a verdict on his career and what he can be. You don't get second chances that often. I can remember, and you can too, when RG3 was the guy. I mean, there are so many quarterbacks through injury or just the reality of how brutal the National Football League is, how hard it is to be successful. There are so many guys who had these moments and these opportunities to be impact players, to be great, to be difference makers. And in some cases, their bodies broke down on them, and it happens. And in some cases, just the fact they weren't good enough broke them down, and they never recovered. Carson Wentz is both of these things. I hate it. I hate it for Carson Wentz. I hate it for the Colts. You don't want guys to get, to get have their careers be over, be altered because of injury. But this isn't puppies and rainbows and tiddly wings fantasy land. It's the National Football League. And remember, this is an NFL that cares so much about the health and safety of its players. It is so committed to the well-being of the guys over money. They added a game. Let, yeah, we re- we're really co- we're going to do another one. Guys are getting bigger, they're getting stronger, they're getting faster, and you got to play more games. This is not an NFL for the light of heart, and it's just not a National Football League for a guy that cannot stay healthy. The Indianapolis Colts need to come up with another solution. I do not have it for them. Figure out who's available. Because this isn't one of those things where it's, I guess we'll just lose some games and we'll draft our quarterback of the future next year. This is the window. This is the opportunity. This is the moment. So if there's a quarterback out there that has any kind of chance of being impactful, if there's a quarterback out there that could be available by trade, if I'm the Colts, I'm being hyper-aggressive. You cannot rely on Carson Wentz. You're not going to rely on on Jacob Eason. He's he's not going to get it done. You made a mistake. And and I'll leave it here, and then we'll get on to some some other sports. Because I don't like kicking people when they're down. I do like kicking people when they're up and they deserve it. That, that I actually really enjoy. I do. I feel bad for the Colts. But there's also a reality, and we see it all the time in all the sports, especially the NFL, where your arrogance gets in your way. And it's hard for successful people. I live in a, a community of very successful people, and I work in a business of very successful people. And one thing that I've realized is that luck can get you to where you're going, hard work can get you to where you're going. Certainly being massively talented gets some people to where they're going. And knowing the right people gets a lot of people to, to, to where they're going. And when you're first starting out and trying to make it, working your way up in, in radio and in TV, selling insurance, trying to be a football coach, trying to be a GM, early on you're so self-aware, 
because you don't have that confidence. You, you don't know if you're going to make it. And, and that means you've taken all the information, and, and I think you avoid mistakes to get where you're going. The more successful people become, the more they start to buy their own hype, the more, the more they start to think everything about how they got here is because they're amazing. And they don't pay attention to the obvious, think they're smarter than the game or smarter than the show or smarter than something else. And it certainly apl- applies to Frank Reich. I understand that if you're Frank Reich and you look back and you say, I was there in 16. I was the offensive coordinator. I was the reason Carson was successful. I was the reason Nick was successful. Look what happened when Nick left. It's me. I'm a genius. I'm sure he doesn't say it that way, but like, I, and I'm going to bring in Carson because I'm smarter than the game. And with all respect to, to Doug, who I love, you know, Doug Peterson's gone now. And, you know, I was the guy and I'm the guy that I've heard, I've heard this, and I probably shouldn't say this because he's my colleague at CBS Sports HQ. I'm sorry, Scott. I've had dinner with Scott Pioli where he told me he was the reason not Bill Belichick that the Patriots were successful. I get it. He was the big hot thing with the Kansas City Chiefs and he bought his own press. It happens to good people like Scott Pioli who thought he was the reason the Patriots were a dynasty, which is, by the way, to be fair to Scott, I thought it was Bill Belichick. Turns out it was Tom Brady all along. Who knew? None of us did. And Frank Reich's better at what he does than what Scott Pioli ever did at what he did. It's just my point. Frank Reich thought he was so smart, he was going to reach back to his past, his glorious insights, and bring the Colts greatness. You know what he did? He didn't pay attention to the obvious facts. He didn't follow the lessons that get you where you're going, which is to be paranoid things are going to go wrong. Carson Wentz is Humpty Dumpty. You don't go down while the king and all of his men are trying to put him back together again and be like, hey, once that last eggshell is put together, would you like to come play quarterback for the Colts? You don't do it. He's going to break again. And he has. I feel bad for Carson Wentz. I feel bad for the Colts. This is who Carson Wentz is, and the Colts deserve him because they should have known better. And that's it. 1-800-636-8686. 1-800-636-8686. At Jim Rome. Oh, yeah. Red's my guy. Or turn it off. Because this, this isn't Baker Street or whatever the hell I got wrong. Yeah. It's Yacht Rock. It's a Yacht Rock Monday on the Jim Rome Show. This song's so terrible. I love it. Christopher Cross, is he still alive? I'm going to go to a Christopher Cross concert. I just said it out loud. Let's go. All right, 1 800 636 8686. Jim Rome at jimrome.com. RomanHaveATake.com. Chris, Christopher Cross, D Van tells me, is 70. 70 as in, as in 70 hits that he has because every song he wrote was a hit because he's Christopher Cross. 70. I am stalling because I do want to hear the whole song. I guess I can do it in the break. All right, let's talk a little, uh, just a little soccer. UN, U.S. men's national team and women's team, very different outcomes. And we'll dive into those things when we ride like the wind next year on the Jim Rome Show. And I've got such a long way. Walking down the road. Tell me Welcome back into the Jim Rome Show. I'm Bill Ryder. Garrett Ritt is so happy. He's Some just rolling all the... Is this America? This town don't look good in snow. Pretty sure the song's terrible, but I love this one, too. 1-800-636-8686. You want to give us a call. Rome at haveatake.com at jimrome, jimrome.com. Yes, I am pausing just to listen to music. Sports writer, sports, R-E-I-T-E-R. I have not been able to, to latch on emotionally with my interest level the, the way that I probably should to the Olympics this year. But there's been some interesting drama. There, there's been some things worth, worth paying attention to. I mean, you have Novak Djokovic going for, until this weekend, the Golden Slam. Try to win all four Grand Slam events in tennis and a gold medal. He was the favorite. And when the Simone Biles thing happened, and I certainly had a perspective on that 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 I think is nuanced, but was not easily compartmentalized into one side or the other, when that went down, Djokovic said pressure is a privilege and was criticized for it. I actually agree with that sentiment to a degree with the right caveats. But you probably, once you say pressure is a privilege, shouldn't have an emotional tantrum meltdown like a four-year-old smash two rackets. And then, and here's the real one because he lost his match then pull out 
of your mixed doubles match costing your partner a chance at her most remarkable moment professionally ever. What a freaking hypocrite. But great, great drama. Uh, U.S. men's national team uh, on, the, um, on the basketball side has had a really interesting road, lost early on, struggled in the exhibitions, but were still and remain the betting favorites, and they play Spain tonight. In fact, I'll be on CBS Sports HQ all day after the show, including after that, after that I think, semifinals is where we're at. And it kind of feels like Spain's going to win this thing, but it'll be a really good basketball game. And that drama is, is, is worth your time. And if you want to check it out, I think the game is on tonight. It's literally, I believe, just before 1 in the morning Eastern time. And I'll be on, on HQ after that, so that'll be 3 in the morning Eastern time. I'm very excited about that hit. Thank you, CBS Sports HQ. And you have, you have heartbreak that happens too. And the U.S. women's national soccer team has obviously women's soccer, U.S. women's soccer, has been a force internationally for a very long time. I can remember where I was standing. I was at the Hitch Street Market at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, in what must have been 1998, when they beat China, I hope I'm getting the year right, in that, in that first World Cup that really began things. And the riot is over, at least the consistency of it, because the women's national team lost to Canada in a hard-fought match, one to nothing. And it's a heartbreaker. It is. And yet at the exact same time, the Gold Cup in CONCACAF, and I don't actually know what the Gold Cup is. I, I'm a, a new soccer fan, right? I, I love Barcelona. I'm watching a lot more soccer. The United States sent out its C team, as in its ABC team, to face a Mexican squad that had a lot of its first team players. And USA Mexico, if you don't follow soccer, is Yankees Red Sox. Is, is, is what it is. Is Ohio State, Michigan. Is Dodgers, Giants. They do not like each other, and they share proximity, obviously, to one another. And, and they butt heads a lot in, in this part of the world in, in that sport. Mexico should have won that match. And if you watched, if you watched the game, I don't know if the guys did or not, probably did because they're both soccer fans, Mexico was so much better. It, it is like I thought. I thought Mexico was clearly the better team. Now, this, we got America, America. Nice return on America, by the way, considering what we're talking about. Was that on purpose? It just hit me. Because I didn't even give you, oh no, Tom's saying no. Rid's saying yes. I certainly didn't give you credit for it at the start of the segment. Way to bring America back in a conversation about America. I thought Mexico was the better team. They controlled the ball two-thirds of the time. Doesn't mean possession of, of, of the ball doesn't mean that you're necessarily better. And I know the States, we had several opportunities throughout the game we didn't capitalize on. I just thought Mexico wasn't just in control of the ball. They operated in our box a lot, and they penetrated, and they had a lot of chances. Who cares? They had four times the talent. That, that's our C team. And we did it, and we got it done. And it wasn't even the Olympics, but it was a really beautiful moment to just remember. Because I found myself watching the game screaming, jumping up and down. My wife was going crazy. I can't even name the American player who went up on a set piece, did his header thing, did the V, right? You try to put it into the ground, pass the goalie. I'm going crazy. I'm not a soccer expert by any stretch, but I watch enough. I know who most of the guys are. All of the, the names in American soccer that hopefully you do know or will know when the World Cup rolls around. This young group, they're all somewhere else. Serginho Des is back playing with Barcelona and... Stuttgart, Germany, I think, is, is where they are. This is random guys. But you know what it was? It was the, the reminder that when it's your country, it doesn't matter their names, doesn't matter the likelihood that they're going to win, doesn't matter whether or not these are people you're ever going to be able to recall again on a radio show if you fill in for Jim Rome the next day and should know each one of their names. I apologize to each and every one of you players. I'm not remembering properly. It was just a really nice moment as an American to feel united in something with all of you, right? All of us together. And the juxtaposition with the, with the women's loss, and again, not joyous, but just if you saw the emotions, the tears, the heartbreak, the, the end of this dream and this, this run of dominance, remind me that I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect into the Olympics here at the end. And not just to watch guys like Djokovic melt down, have emotional tantrums, and, and really sort of enjoy his losing. That there's still a little bit of time. And Simone Biles, by the way, is going to do this final routine. And have an opportunity. I hope she's. I hope she's okay. I hope she's safe. I mean, again, I won't. I won't rehash my, my view on on Simone Biles. I, I'll very quickly. I think she deserves other utter sympathy, 
and no criticism of her character. And I also think it's fair and legitimate to say she wasn't able to succeed at the Olympic Games. Like that's they can both be true. It's okay. But in her case, unlike Novak Djokovic or the U.S. women's national soccer team or Kevin Durant and the guys tonight against against Spain or it wasn't the Olympics but the dudes in the Gold Cup, she can actually put herself in some harm's way. I mean, the sport that she practices, if you have a meltdown like, like Novak Djokovic did, the only thing that's going to get truly injured is your reputation and apparently your tennis rackets, which happened in, in both cases. If things go really badly... On the pitch in soccer, right? You just, you, you just, you, you've got the yips. You're just going to embarrass yourself, and you're going to kick the ball really far left. Same thing for for basketball. I guess what's the analogy here? You're gonna, you're gonna have some, some, some air ball of some kind in gymnastics, especially with Simone Biles. I mean, she's going up on the air, and there is always the risk that you could land on your head and, and severely hurt herself. And, and I love that she is feeling comf- confident enough and, and, and comfortable enough to get out there and to compete and, and to go for gold. And she is interesting in the sense she is like like Novak. He is already, I hate to to make this statement, though it's already true. She's the greatest of all time. Simone Biles is the greatest gymnast in, the, I think, the history of the sport. And I covered gymnastics in London in 2012, so I I actually can speak about this with a little more expertise than probably the average talk show, radio, sports radio host. She's the greatest of all time. And so I hope that that her, what will almost certainly be her, her final run, ends with some glory and some gold and just a sense that she gets to go out on her own terms. So, yay USA Soccer. And even though the women lost, j- just a reminder for me, the power and how cool it is that we are, all of us, in a pretty divided time, somewhat connected through these Olympics. So, thank you, Garrett Ritt, for, for, for coming back with America, Go America, Team America, all the way. NBA free agency is underway, it, officially, at 6 Eastern time. But, as we already know, there's always, always NBA players and other op- who are operating before they're supposed to. So when the deadline hits today, like it does every single day, that's technically 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, when you're supposed to be able to start talking to players. But you always have news that drops right away because, you know, guys make life-changing decisions 30 seconds and or there's collusion that happens on a regular basis. There's a lot of big names. Chris Paul has opted out. Kawhi Leonard has opted out. DeMar DeRozan is available. John Collins, Lonzo Ball are restricted free agents. That's interesting. Uh, Kyle Lowry, we're going to visit with Howard Beck from Sports Illustrated. We're going to get his view and his perspective on what to expect when that deadline hits a few hours from now. So some NBA talk with Howard here on the Jim Rome Show after we get a CBS Sports Radio update with Rich Ackerman. Live from Southern California, this is the Jim Rome Show with guest host Bill Ryder on CBS Sports Radio. All right, welcome back into the Jim Rome Show. What is going on, Bill Ryder, with you? Our next guest is uh, is one of the best NBA writers and reporters in the country. You can read him at Sports Illustrated. He's a great guy, and I believe someday, I guess it wouldn't be mayor, he'll be the He'll tell us. The alderman of Brooklyn. He literally is the dean of Brooklyn, New York. Everyone else is just is just pretending. He's a power broker. Howard Brooklyn Beck on the show. Hello, Mr. Beck. <laughs> Mr. Ryder, how are you, sir? I'm uh, glad. As always, I'm good. Way, way too kind, way too generous of an introduction. Thank you. You're welcome. It's all true at Sports Illustrated. If you want to read Mr. Beck's work on Twitter at Howard Beck, which is easy to find, easy to remember. I hope you're having a good summer, buddy. So free agency get, gets going here in, in a little bit. Are, are we just at the point now where the NBA doesn't care if, if there is collusion, conversations, recruiting by players? That's That's just the new normal? Well, I mean, it's been the normal for a long time on various levels. Um, there's always been the player-to-player stuff. The, the part that rankles the NBA at the league office, or it certainly rankles a lot of small market teams especially, which then eventually leads to, to the league office trying to rein it in, is, is the just blatant tampering. But this is a tampering league. That's an actual quote from a GM, um, multiple GMs over the years who have said, hey, it's a tampering league. Uh, it's just kind of the way business is done. The free agency technically starts at 6 o'clock Eastern time today, but the discussions with free agents have been going on through various channels for weeks already. 
you know, you put out feelers, you talk to agents, you talk to an agent under the guise of something that is legal, and while you're in that conversation, you throw in a few illegal things. Like, oh, by the way, what do you, you know, your other client, what, what's he looking for this summer? So, like, by the time we actually get to free agency opening, you know where things are heading. And that's why you've got all these reports over the last few days of things that look like a done deal or, you know, if, if somebody's being reported as looking like the leader of the pack for free agent A, <laughs> what that really probably means is that they already have a deal in place, but because the NBA has tried to crack down on tampering, tried in quote marks, over the last couple of years, they're trying to shroud it a little bit more. So you're leaking deals without saying it's a deal, and you're getting media outlets to say, to put it in a little bit less definitive language so that nobody can after the fact say, well, how did this happen? And if you just say, well, there's a leader, as opposed to saying there's a deal in place, then it gives everybody an opening or an out. Howard, back here on the Jim Rome Show. Okay, so one of the leaders in the clubhouse is um, Kyle Lowry to the Miami Heat. Certainly not done. Certainly not, you know, pre prearranged by, by him and his buddy Jimmy Butler. If, Howard Beck, Mr. Lowry goes to the Heat, where does that place them in the Eastern Conference for you in terms of competitiveness? Obviously, a lot of other deals yet to be done, right? We need to see how the Nets replenish their roster around their big three. We need to see what the Bucks do to bolster their defending championship core. Um, what do the Sixers get back for Ben Simmons? Um, that's the real conversation, you know, for the rest of the, of the conference. And, you know, you could throw a couple other teams in there that are knocking on the door. You know, the, the Hawks certainly made a, a nice run of the conference finals unexpectedly and should not be dismissed as a potential, you know, repeat contender in, in that regard. I think the Heat, a lot of things just w- did not go their way this year. For all this, the talk of like, hey, they got all these breaks or maybe they were perfectly calibrated for the bubble and that's how they got to the finals a year ago. And this year everything went the other way, right? Um, Some guys looked at their age. Some guys broke down. Jimmy Butler had COVID. And, you know, a lot of things just did not break right for them. Um, They still have, I think, a really strong core there. And if they, you know, are able to retain Duncan Robinson and and they've got, you know, obviously Jimmy Butler, Adebayo, Tyler Hero, there's a really good core there. And Kyle Lowry is a perfect Heat player. So where does that place them? I mean, Kyle is up there in years, but still a very effective player. I, I think it, he makes them that much tougher of a tough, def- t- already def- tough defensive team. Gives them another another shot maker, upgrades them at point guard, um, and, and gives them you know somebody else who can kind of keep things going when Jimmy Butler's off the court, uh, taking a rest. I think they're back in the mix. I mean, I had them in the mix this past season anyway, and they, they fell far short of that. But I thought they should have been a contender. I, I think they'll be right back into the conversation if they get Kyle Lowry. Howard, back as, as Daryl Morey peruses the market for Ben Simmons and is, you know, if and when we get a deal, if you're Simmons, right, you're, you're, you're Simmons' agent, is there a team or a couple teams where you think, just for him, it's the right fit, it's the right place for, I think, a very talented guy, but obviously one – who has come under a lot of criticism for some struggles in the postseason and the inability to to you you know shoot the basketball, which is sort of important in the NBA. Is there a spot that makes sense for him? There's a lot of different ways to look at that. Like he's he's a guy who's been a multiple time All Star and he's been All NBA. So on one level, you'd say, well, he's just entering his prime and he's got several years on his deal, so he's gonna he should be somewhere that's a team that's already pretty respectable or contending. But with contention comes scrutiny, and the scrutiny is part of what's hurt him because he doesn't shoot, doesn't want to shoot. Um, and, you know, now that's why, among the reasons why the Sixers have to move on, because, like, you can't even imagine him being back in Philly and, and what the, the reception would be like. I think he needs to go somewhere that's not just another good quality franchise. I think it's best for him to probably go somewhere where there's maybe not quite as much scrutiny. Maybe a smaller market would be better for him right now. Maybe somewhere, obviously, with a. Uh, really great development staff that can work out the kinks, both mental and physical to do with his jump shot. If he's going to take the next step, next step in his career, if he's truly going to be an MVP caliber player, which he's got the potential to be, he's got to get that part of his game in order. It is important as a primary ball handler, but then another way to look at this would be, well, maybe he should just go somewhere where he's not the primary ball handler. Maybe he should be somewhere where they've got a strong point guard already and he's a secondary playmaker, not full-time point. He can still guard point guards. He can guard all five positions. That's one of the, the you know one of the things that makes him great. But maybe he shouldn't be the guy with the ball in his hands all the time if he's not going to shoot because that that 
really can can stunt your offense in this league. So where does that land him? I don't know. I don't think it's going to be about where's best for Ben Simmons. It's going to be ultimately about where can the Sixers and Daryl Morey get the best return package. That's He's going to end up with, with whoever gives the best basket of stuff back to the Sixers. That descript- Those two descriptions, Howard Beck, that you gave here on the Jim Rome Show, the first sort of sounds like the Toronto Raptors could be, and the second certainly sounds like the Golden State Warriors would, would be an interesting fit for him. Yeah, I mean, that, that those are teams I had in mind, certainly for those those scenarios, right? Like the Raptors, even though it's a huge market, it's and, and within that market, certainly, like Toronto media can be, you know, just as, as aggressive as New York or Philly, but it would give him a chance with a team that has done a great job of developing players to maybe get his game in order. And with even if Lowry's leaving, maybe Dragic is there um, in that deal. Maybe it's just, you know, Fred Van Vliet running things. But he, it wouldn't require Ben Simmons to be full-time uh, with the ball in his hands and maybe give him a chance to, to you, know, you know, work on the jump shot. So they're, and they're a great team in terms of player development. You know, San Antonio, obviously, is a great team in terms of player development. Miami is a great team in terms of player development. I mean, not all these teams are going to be in the running. I'm just saying there, there are a bunch of teams that I think could help him out in that regard. I don't see him going, ending up with the Warriors. But, yes, any team like the Warriors, um, you know, if, 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 we, if there was a uh, – you know, the C.J. McCollum and more stuff for Ben Simmons scenario that's been talked about, Ben Simmons with Dame Lillard could work because, again, Lillard's the primary ball handler in that scenario. And when Simmons does have the ball in his hands, you've got one of the great shooters in the NBA there playing off the ball. Howard, I recognize the question I'm about to ask you is the equivalent of asking someone in, I don't know, literary circles what J.D. Salinger was thinking when he was around. But I'm going to ask anyway. What do you think becomes of, of Kawhi Leonard and his decision-making over the next week or so? Nobody knows when it comes to Kawhi, but all rumblings are, are you know, indicating he's going to stay with the Clippers. I've never expected anything different. He could surprise us. He has surprised us all before. But he, he, he went to such great lengths to get to L.A. Remember, when he got traded to Toronto, that's not where he wanted to be. He wanted to be in L.A. with one of the L.A. teams. And... It wasn't in his hands at that point because was, it was a trade. He won a championship in Toronto, and as soon as he could leave, he did. Not because of, of anything to do with Toronto, but he wanted to be in L.A. He's from Southern California. Having done all that to get there, I don't see why he would turn around and leave. There's failures, if you could call it that, there in his two years there. Um, you know, It's been the two most unusual years in NBA history. And in this case, it also had him with an ACL injury that the Clippers never disclosed until it was after the season, long after the season. Um, and so if they failed this, this, off, this, this postseason, it wasn't because they didn't have the right personnel. It's because Kawhi himself was hurt. So you're going to hold that against the franchise? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. Um, they can pay him the most. They can pay him for the longest period of time because that's the way it goes in the NBA. I expect he stays. Uh, Howard, in the weeds a little bit here with Atlanta, but you mentioned them as a team not to overlook. John Collins is a restricted free agent. They weren't able to, to come to an agreement before this point, how important do you think it is for, for the Hawks to find whatever the number is? I think I saw $120 million reported as, as what might get it done and, and make sure he's back in the mix. Because they, they did make that run with DeAndre Hunter mostly injured. Yeah, I mean, they've got one of the best young cores in the NBA. And they added some really nice veterans on top of it last offseason. Some of those guys were hurt all year, and Chris Dunn was one of those. And he, you know, they shipped him out, and it took a while for for Gallinari to get healthy. But they've got a really nice mix, and John Collins is is a really talented young player. They couldn't come to agreement on an extension last year, um, and I think if they had been a first round and out team, maybe you'd say, ah, you know what, maybe we, maybe we still don't want to overextend and pay him because we've got all these other young players coming up. Trey Young's got to be extended. Kevin Herter's going to have to be extended. Like you have to set a limit somewhere because in the NBA, the luxury tax penalty has become very onerous very quickly. But having just made this unexpected run to the conference finals with this great young team, that's still just getting better. And John Collins was such a critical part of that. I don't see how you let him walk. I think you go all out to keep him. You, you deal with the finances later. You figure out all, all, all of that stuff at when you, you know, when you have to, but in the meantime, don't let, a tremendous asset, a, a tremendous young talent, walk away. Howard Beck here on the Jim Rome Show. Howard, the last year, and all the weirdness for the whole country, has had people 
reevaluating huge parts of their lives. So I don't know if you've gotten to the point where you love hot takes now because you used to hate them, but there have been, there's been change afoot. I, I don't know. I, I want you to be able to lean into this hot take thing if you want. And I, 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 I preface, I, I say all that to, to ask you this. Russell Westbrook plus the Los Angeles Lakers is going to equal what? Um, less than the uh, pyrotechnics of that deal would suggest. <laughs> you can go hot take. That's such a great t- – I agree. You can say it in a mean way if you want to. I'm not trying to bait you. I'm just saying you can really no, go I aggressive mean, if listen, you want. There, did, they, did they need high-level playmaking? Like, did they need somebody else who could do something with the ball in his hands, score, or set up other guys when LeBron is – off the court or in the case of the worst case scenarios where LeBron is out for, you know, six weeks or whatever, like, yeah, like Russell Westbrook fills a need, but he fills a need at, at, a, at a tremendous cost in terms of depth, tremendous cost in terms of salary, a tremendous cost in terms of flexibility, a tremendous cost in terms of potentially stifling their offense when those guys are out there together because he can't space the floor because he can't shoot. He's the worst shooter among high volume scorers in the league and has been for years. And He's at an age where that's only going to get worse. So his production and his efficiency is only going to, to decline. I hate the deal. I really do. Um, it, there's a scenario in which it works out, right? There's a scenario in which LeBron staying fresher, LeBron having less burden on his shoulders. Um, maybe Rob Palenka finds a bunch of shooters out there to take the minimum to fill out this roster. And maybe they're fine. And maybe they're at least as good as they were this past season. But they weren't good enough to you know, get out of the first round this season. Um, and injuries had a lot to do with that. With a healthy LeBron and a healthy Anthony Davis and, and, and the wild card that is Russell Westbrook, they will be a potent force in the West. Do I think they can win, uh, win it all with Westbrook clogging up everything with his inability to shoot and being a high turnover guy and being a, a, a low defensive guy? I, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm highly skeptical, but I'm open to the possibility that if they find a way to fill out the roster well, that – they could make another run. I'm just telling you right now, Howard, if we were on my show in the mornings, I would have dropped seven what the Becks, just like right <laughs> following that very accurate, correct, I have no doubt, and measured response. Um, Howard Beck, my friend, the insight is great. Love the conversation. Appreciate you being on the show, buddy. Have a great rest of your summer and good luck the next few weeks working. Thanks, Bill. Take care, man. <laughs> you do, dude. Howard Beck on the show. Howard is the most even keeled, fair. I love having Howard on because we often think the exact same thing and say it in in vastly, vastly different ways. Because my my version of that is that um, that Russell Westbrook move is the height of idiocy and allows LeBron James to win the press conference and and not to think long term. And by the way, I said last week on CBS Sports HQ because I had heard that DeMar DeRozan – might take less money to be a Laker. Now, he made $27 million with the Spurs this past year, and I think what the Lakers could offer him is 5.9 is what it is. And there's a report that just came out in the last hour from, I think, The Athletic, saying that, that DeRozan's serious about the Lakers, which, on, again, on paper is great. He also clogs the floor. He's also not a shooter. I, I, you take, I mean, I get you take DeMar DeRozan, 100%. I'm just not sure that it makes sense. All right, enough NBA talk. Let's get to some baseball. I'm a Cubs fan. Garrett's a Cubs fan. There's a game truism. On. Game on, baby. There's a, a truism in, in Cubs lore that when you trade a guy, they become even better than they were. Turns out that's correct. On the trade deadline, how the Cubs are going to help other teams be successful, of course, next year on the Jim Rome Show. Hey, we're the hosts of Pod Save America. Every week we break down the political news that makes us laugh, cry, and scream into the void with a conversation that's entertaining, informative, and hopefully useful. We try to be serious without taking ourselves too seriously because we all have to stay in the fight. Democracy is under attack, and there's a whole right-wing machine that's counting on the rest of us to give up and check out, and we can't let them win. So join us. New episodes of Pod Save America drop Mondays and Thursdays. Listen for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey, or wherever you get your podcasts.